Okay, I think uh, we need to get started. It's 4.30. So hello everyone to the, to the GI open meeting. Um, uh, I know we have a few people who are online. So I hope you're having a, a good time at SWAG and San Francisco. Um, we have two hours um, and we have a packed schedule and we have the same thing in the morning. Uh, the idea is to really finish the meeting in time so that people can, can go to the other meetings or go out. Uh, because of travel issues, uh, some of our speakers needed uh, to be um, rearranged so that they can, they can start earlier, they can leave uh, to catch a, a train, a plane. So we'll do that. Um, we will start off with our um, DEI uh, subcommittee, and I'd like to invite um, Rachel, Colmar, and Yoana, if you're still here. Um, I just uh, give us a brief um, um, overview of what things are being done and the, the goals of the subcommittee. So this, this subcommittee was started um, exactly a year ago. And we really, uh, it was very interesting today. We have a number of initiatives that um, the subcommittee is really working on. So I just wanted Colmar to give it an idea of what's going on. Come on. So I'll be pretty brief. I wanted to introduce uh, Rachel Seif, Dr. Rachel Seifan and Dr. Johanna um, Pampalova. Um, it looks like our committee may be expanding soon to include more ind individuals, which is a wonderful thing. Um, basically, brief update of where we've we what we've been working on. We've been working on a retrospective uh, study using SWOG data, um, looking at uh, how we are recruiting women and minorities um, from 2001 to the present. And so that's one of the things that we've been working on. Um, where we are now is that we've been developing a recruitment and retention form to help investigators really zero in on their recruitment procedures and, and be able to help improve and navigate uh, possible landmines in terms of recruitment and retention. Um, um, where are we going? Um, we have a few prospective studies. Um, one looking at the, the issue of incentives and how incentives may improve our recruitment and retention process, as well as translational um, uh, data analysis using bank tissue data. So at this time, um, I will um, also, you know, some other educational opportunities. At this time, I'd like to return it back to Philippe. Uh, but before you go, just to see if uh, anyone has a question or making a comment. So this is a very young subcommittee, and um, it's a very important one in terms of the future directions uh, for the GI committee. And if anyone wants to get involved or you have any ideas, uh, please do that. Uh, this morning after uh, the end of the uh, meeting, in the closed meeting, we had at least one investigator who expressed a lot of interest in being part of the subcommittee, and I think you're going to include her. So we will. So this is very important. If there are no other questions, then we can move forward. So next, we're going to talk, uh, to uh, discuss briefly a few of the active SWAG trials, and um, I'm going to start off with uh, uh, SWAG 1922. And I know Michael Overman is not here. Maybe Phil, you can go to the microphone, or you can come here, whichever one you prefer. Um, so there will be a few people coming backwards and forwards for these uh, studies. Um, Excellent. Hey, good afternoon. So uh, this trial, SWOG 1922, was a randomized trial in the second line for patients with metastatic uh, small body adenocarcinoma. And uh, as you can imagine, it's tough to accrue. It's a, it's a rare disease. So uh, we've been really patient and, um, uh, you know, it's up in, in many, many sites and uh, we currently have uh, about half accrued. Uh, the randomizations between uh, ramucirumab and Taxol versus uh, Fulfiri. 
And um, we've just uh, done an amendment uh, to curtail the sample size uh, to that 54 number. So we hope uh, we'll uh, continue to accrue to this trial and get it done because it remains an unmet need with no real standard of care. Thank you. So can you ask him? Yeah. So how many people have the trial open in their institutions? Show of hand. Okay, so not, not too many. Is it because of the rare disease? Is that what people think that your IRBs are having difficulty in a rare situation and you won't be accruing that many patients? Or is just lack of interest in the in the space? Second line. Tony, you, you want to say something? Uh, we we had it open, but we were forced to close it after two years because we didn't put anybody on it. You know, it's it's one of those where I'd love to have it open as a just in time study. You know, because you certainly know when these patients are coming through and they're on their you know, first line and you can sort of figure out what to do. So, I mean, those places that can do that, and unfortunately we're not set up yet to do first, you know, just in time. This would be a great study for that. I think that's, that's fair, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Chung. Great, thank you. So this is S2001, which is a randomized phase two study of Olaparib uh, plus or minus Pembro for uh, maintenance therapy for germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, mutated pancreatic cancer. And this was developed in collaboration with Alliance and Michael Pishvine is my co-chair for this study. Um, just a little bit of background, back in 2019 when um, Olaparib was approved, uh, the NCCN guidelines actually added germline testing at that time as standard of care for all patients with pancreatic cancer. So please remember that when you have a um, patient with diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, they immediately send for germline testing because that is part of standard of care for this particular protocol. So here's the treatment schema. Um, patients uh, undergo standard of care germline testing. Uh, so once you know that they have uh, germline BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, the best treatment, of course, is going to be a platinum-based chemotherapy. So you need to have a minimum of uh, 16 weeks of platinum-based chemotherapy prior to um, getting randomized to either Laparib or Laparib plus Pembro. Now, in January 2022, we did amend the study because we're having difficulty accruing. And the amendment allows one cycle of gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. So it allows you to actually um, start gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. Once you get the germline testing, if they are BRCA1 or BRCA2 positive, then you'd have to um, add a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. We also took the upper limit away. So it used to be they had to have four to six months of therapy. So now, as long as they've had a minimum of four months, if they had like eight months of you know platinum-based chemotherapy and having a great response, they can now still uh, accrue on the study. And I wanna thank all of you um, for your support of the study because this year we've really picked up accrual. So we're actually accruing about two to three per month. So um, we're actually doing you know, quite well actually this year for the study. So for the statistics, we're looking for an enrollment sample size of 88 subjects. We're looking for an improvement in the median PFS of seven months up to 11.7 .7 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6. So we currently have 32 out of 88 subjects accrued, and we are going to be doing a futility analysis when we get to 50% accrual. So that'll happen probably later on this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions, comments? Um... Uh, especially uh, relating to getting faster accrual. We would like to complete the trial and go to the next one in this space uh, if we can do it fast. No comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to have um, uh, either Heloise, I don't think she's here, or Sai. Yeah. So so this will be 2104, which is a... Um, adjuvant trial in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you, Philip. So uh, this is um, a study, hold on, next slide. Here we go. So this is a uh, SWOC 2104, which is a phase two randomized trial evaluating um, adjuvant uh, capecitabine and temozolomide in patients with high-risk pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So standard of care right now for patients with neuroendocrine tumors is really uh, 
surgery and then observation. And we know there's a subset of people that have high risk recurrence. And based on data from the advanced setting, uh, which demonstrated the benefit to kipcitabine and temozolomide, we have utilized this in this study, which is uh, really taking patients with grade two, three neuron contumers uh, with um, high KI67 um, um, and uh, two to one randomizing them to either observation or cap capecitabine and temozolomide. Uh, you can see this is a study that's been being performed uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Soares, myself, and Dr. Washington. Um, the uh, expected um, accrual is sample size of 154. St thus far, we have enrolled 16 patients onto the study. Uh, there are still numerous sites that are um, have this, the trial and evaluation in terms of getting through the approval process. And so we, we're hoping in the next several months, we'll have multiple more sites on board. Uh, and some of the sites that are about to open the study are high volume sites that we think will help accrual as well. Now, in terms of eligibility, uh, these are again, resected patients um, who've had a scan within 90 days of their surgery. Um, one of the amendments we've recently made is to um, um, now requiring either a multi-phase CT scan or MRI. We're no longer allowing for um, uh, dotatate PET CTs. Um, the eligibility is really, really based upon uh, something that we've named the ZADI score. Um, and that's based on data from the U.S. Neurocontumor Collaborative. And that includes variables such as tumor size, lymph node positivity, KI67, and uh, liver metastasis is also allowed as long as at the time of surgery, the tumors in the liver are completely resected or ablated. Another amendment we've recently made is to allow for post-operative octreotide use. This was, we found a barrier to enrollment. And um, uh, so we are now allowing that in the post-operative period, as long as they're off the octreotide prior to enrollment onto the study. And so I, I do think this is an important study in a, in a uh, subset of patients that currently the standard is to just observe, no, even though we know a subset will recur. And so hopefully uh, you'll have the study open and, and accrue to this study. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions, comments? Um, Surgeons, any comments? Flavio? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next. Um, uh, Lance, I, I, you're on. Hello, Dr. Morris will uh, discuss uh, 2107. Hey everybody. Um, so we're going to give an update on the SWOG 2107 study. This is a trial that's looking at um, encarafitib and cetuximab with or without nivolumab for patients with microsatellite stable uh, treatment refractory BRAF V600E metastatic colorectal cancer. We'll just kind of remind everybody the standard of care for patients um, based on the prior phase three beacon trial in this uh, poor prognostic population of patients is encarafenib and cetuximab, the um, control arm for this study. Um, in that uh, trial, in the phase three trial reported a response rate of 20% uh, with an overall median, P or sorry, a median PFS of around four months with encarafenib cetuximab alone. The lead in trial at MD Anderson that supported uh, encarafenib, cetuximab, and nivolumab, we saw a response rate of around 50% uh, and a median PFS of seven and a half months. And this is based uh, also and supported on uh, kind of translational data, which suggests that, oh wait, I don't know what's happening. Um, which, uh, which, uh, which suggests that uh, that the this specific population of MSS BRF E630D metastatic colorectal cancer is characterized by increased immune activation. So patients are randomized um, two to one. Um, so a two thirds chance of participants will likely be randomized to the arm with encarafitib, cetuximab, and nivolumab. We activated the study um, less than a year ago now, and we're already at a third of the way through accrual, um, getting about five patients a month. So um, again, very promising um, clinical data, scientific data, and please consider the study. Any questions? Any questions, comments? 
Okay, thanks. Very much. Um, next, we have uh, 2303, maybe either Zev or Saima can update on the study. This is study um, PIs, Dr. Said and Dr. Oberstein. Oh, is Dr. Oberstein here? Sorry, I can't see. Oh, you, Paul, do you want to present it? Oh, here we are. Sorry, I, I couldn't see from that. I'm sorry. sorry. Just one, just one slide. One slide and no picture. Yeah. So, so this is SWAG 2303, which is <clears throat> hopefully uh, working on getting it activated. Um, we'll, we're hoping for later this year. It's a phase two slash three trial, second line therapy for advanced gastric cancer, gastric anesophageal adenocarcinoma, uh, looking at specifically a PDL1 positive population, so a CPS score of greater than or equal to one. Uh, and it's a randomized one to one study of paclitaxel and ramucirumab as a standard of care, or paclitaxel, ramucirumab, and nivolumab um, as the experimental arm. The, L, the qualifications for the study are patients who've had prior IO therapy in first line. Uh, it could be any immunotherapy, and they've had progression or intolerance on first line therapy. So we're essentially evaluating the role of immunotherapy in second line after progression on first line immunotherapy. And the, just briefly, the design is it's gonna be a, a randomized phase two initially, looking at PFS and if there's activity and we hit our metric there, it'll expand to become a phase three trial, looking at overall survival as the primary endpoint. And this, the PDL one is any, right? Any, any above zero, anything yeah. positive. So anything above zero, Patient qualified. Um, questions? Uh, so these are patients who, by and large, would have received prior treatment with uh, immunotherapy, right? Correct. They all they all have received prior it's a requirement, prior IO. Okay. So uh, we 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 feel that this is a very important trial. So we would um, hope that you open it. Uh, at this point in time, the estimated the uh, time to open the trial, uh, to have it ready as a protocol is uh, September. Maybe someone correct me if I'm wrong. Catherine? So hopefully you'll be able to open it uh, September, right? You will have a protocol ready in September. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, uh, 0802 and uh, I don't know if, uh, Jason is here. Maybe Phil can fill in. Yes. Where is it? I don't see it. No, just move it one. It wasn't there. Go back. Okay. You, you can just talk. Uh, you just mentioned the study. You don't know. Okay. You, you didn't say so our prevention trial, uh, Dr. Zell's the PI with the Selendac and the Flornithine has been open for literally 10 years, about 350 patients, and uh, it's closing June 30th, and only patients who have been pre-registered are gonna be allowed to uh, complete the process. So there uh, should be no new accruals, obviously, just ones that have already been in the pipeline. And um, uh, congratulations to Jason and the team for being so persistent over the 10 years to get this study uh, done. It's been modified a few times, both with respect to the number of treatment arms and the stat section, I believe once or twice. Um, and uh, with about 350 patients, it will be wrapped up uh, next month. Thank you. So it's a prevention trial. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Jen, do you want to tell us about 2012? Uh, yes, so thank you. Uh, so this is a uh, SWOG S2012. Uh, um, so this study I co-lead with uh, Dr. Kiorian, who's mentored me through this, and unfortunately she could not join us uh, today. Uh, so this is a randomized phase two, three study of first-line platinum metoposide with or without atezolizumab in 
patients with poorly differentiated extrapulmonary small cell neuroendocrine carcinomas. So the background is that this group of patients, uh, essentially we've uh, extrapolated our management uh, for decades from small cell lung cancer using platinum etoposide and survivals remain poor and we've not made a lot of headway. And so really we're trying to see whether uh, using checkpoint inhibitors, which is now standard of care in a first line setting for small cell lung cancer would also be beneficial for extra pulmonary neuroendocrine carcinomas. Um, so this study was originally activated in December of 2021. And so this is uh, for patients who have advanced or metastatic poorly differentiated extra pulmonary neuroendocrine carcinomas. And when originally designed was uh, restricted to small cell histology only. Um, and we're pretty broad here. We're allowing uh, also one prior treat, uh, up to one prior treatment of platinum etoposide, which is uh, pretty important for this patient population because we, oftentimes we know that we need to initiate treatment uh, for these patients pretty quickly. Um, and we're stratifying based on performance status and also disease origin of prostate versus GI versus other. And what you'll notice here is this is a little bit different from small cell lung cancer trials where it, there were only usually two arms where the control arm is platinum etoposide for four cycles for induction, followed then by observation of no progression versus chemoimmunotherapy induction with atezolizumab for four cycles and then uh, one year of maintenance. Um, but there's this red uh, arm here, which is uh, induction chemoimmunotherapy followed by observation. And this was a recommendation made by the NCI, since we don't have any prospective data about what the role of monotherapy checkpoint inhibitor in this, is this in the disease. And so the endpoint here is overall survival uh, from time of randomization, with also looking at a secondary endpoint of uh, survival, uh, basically from the, the maintenance portion as well. And the main update I really want to provide is that uh, when we restricted the small cell only, and part of the rationale for that was uh, a competition with another ECOG study that was going on, and that has now since closed. And so we use that opportunity to amend the study. And so now we're basically allowing any histological subtype, so both large cell and small cell. And sometimes we can't even call out the histology. So we've also allowed uh, language in the criteria, as long as you have a diagnosis of high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, in a K67 to 55% or greater, uh, patients will be eligible for the study. Um, we also received a lot of feedback from sites that the imaging frequency, particularly during the surveillance op observation was a little too frequent and that uh, a lot of the insurance companies were not covering that frequency of scans. So we've actually extended the frequency of scans and that's outlined here and also outlined in the protocol. And prior to amendment, uh, we were only able to enroll three patients per year, so it was pretty poor. Uh, but since we've amended the protocol, we are now uh, at about three patients per month. And so the current enrollment is 11 out of 189. So we're hoping the amendment will help. And we've uh, noticed a lot of sites are starting to express interest. So if you don't have this study open, please do consider opening study. Okay. Anyone want to make any comment? I think, sorry. Open the study originally because we thought it was going to be too rare and we just weren't going to have the patients. And when you put through the amendments that really made it so much easier to find patients, we just opened it. So great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, what we'll do next is uh, we'll go to um, the disease sites. That will be what we'd like to do. Um, in your, um, we will leave this in the, to the disease sites and um, including Janice, unless, uh, um, Dr. Scott, I, do you want to come and talk about this study? And then we will have uh, Dr. Desari uh, discuss Janice and then we'll move into disease sites. Thank you, Dr. Philip. Um, yes, yeah, so I can give a brief update on our trial NRG GI005, um, otherwise known as the COBRA study. This is in uh, patients with resected stage 2A colon cancer, so T3N0 colon cancer, um, in patients who physicians have decided that they do not or would not be appropriate for adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, this trial randomizes patients into two arms. Arm one is in standard of care or active surveillance arm, where samples, uh, blood samples, um, imaging, et cetera, will be collected for CTDNA analysis. Um, and then in arm two is assay-directed therapy. So if patients have a CTDNA blood draw that is positive, they will go into active treatment with modified full FOX6 or KPOX, 
based on standard uh, dosing for adjuvant uh, treatment and um, otherwise appropriate patients uh, versus CTDA not detected, which is also active surveillance. We're approaching uh, patient numbers for the go, no go for the phase three portion of this trial. Uh, so we're very excited about that. We've enrolled a total of 577 patients and this number continues to go up. Um, in fact, our accruals per month are getting um, are improving. Uh, I will say though that if you are a SWOG investigator and have not opened this trial, we strongly encourage that you do so. Uh, we obviously think this is a very important study, especially for this group of patients where CTD uh, positivity or, or, or results could highly impact uh, outcomes. Um, and if you have opened this trial and uh, you have not been able to put patients on, you're finding barriers to the study, please let us know, uh, myself or Dr. Uh, Van Morris, who is the lead PI. Um, so currently SWOG has enrolled 33 patients. We'd love to see that number continue to go up. And that's my update. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Is there a reason why people wouldn't open this trial? Good reason. Yeah, is there a good reason? No, yes. Okay, it's an important trial. I... Yeah, we all agree. Thank you, Dr. Philip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Dr. Dasari. So this is the uh, phase two uh, Janus uh, trial that's uh, being co-led by Alliance, NRG, uh, and uh, SWOG. I'm the SWOG and uh, medical oncology PI uh, for this trial. So this trial is asking the question of what's the appropriate consolidation chemotherapy regimen uh, in TNT for patients with uh, locally advanced uh, rectal cancer. Uh, patients with uh, locally advanced rectal cancer will be randomized uh, to long course chemo radiation followed by a doublet of full FOX or KPOX versus uh, long course chemo radiation followed by uh, full Firinox. The uh, primary endpoint uh, is a complete uh, clinical response uh, and is uh, power to uh, detect a difference uh, of about absolute of about 17% from about 50 to 67%. Uh, uh, with these statistics, uh, we need about 312 patients uh, total, uh, and the randomization is one to one. Uh, it was activated late uh, last year. Uh, it's enrolling really well. Uh, 40 patients enrolled out of the total 312, and sites are still opening the uh, tri trial. So again, another very important trial, um, organ preservation question in it. Um, accruing well. Okay, so um, with that, we move on to... Okay, so before we do that, um, in, in your agenda, I might have noticed there was something about uh, liquid biopsy, circulating tumor DNA, I was going to give an update. Um, I will leave that update for next meeting. Well, that's six months uh, because uh, we haven't finished the report. Uh, this is a CTEP-sponsored CTEP uh, working group that we were going to uh, complete and, uh, and, and also create a, a white paper. So since we haven't completed that, I was uh, really thinking that best thing would be to just wait until um, another meeting, which will be six months, but just to let you know that these are being updated and we're doing presentations to the task forces. So some of you who are members of the task forces have an idea of um, of that work, but it's not complete yet. So I'd rather wait until that happens for an open uh, meeting. So uh, we go ahead with the rectal anal subcommittee. Uh, I think um, Lisa, you had a meeting to catch, so. Okay. So on behalf of uh, uh, Dr. Hagen, oops, there we go, Kenneke and myself, hopefully I won't need my glasses that are now on the floor. Thanks, Philip. I dropped them. I don't need them. 
Yeah. It's very dark up here. I know. I'm, with the Mac, I'm not used to the uh, not Mac computer. So I, I just wanted to uh, tell everyone there's two great abstracts uh, at ASCO being presented. The first at the plenary is the prospect trial, which we've talked about and supported here. And that's a randomized phase three looking at neoadjuvant chemo radiation versus Folfox with selective use of chemo radiation based on MRI response followed by TME for locally advanced rectal. And Dr. Schrag will have the, the wonderful plenary uh, that we all look forward to. And then I also wanted to uh, uh, make mention of the Prodige 23 phase three trial, and that's total neoadjuvant therapy with Fulfirinox versus pre-op chemo radiation for locally advanced rectal cancer. And that's gonna be their seven year results. So. Go to ASCO. Um, I'm looking forward to the plenary. So we have three open trials. Uh, you heard about the Janus already, but I'll talk about it in context of a new trial coming. Um, the first is the decrease trial, and that's looking at de-escalation or de-intensified chemoradiation for early stage anal squamous cell cancer. Dr. Jim Murphy is our uh, SWOG champion on this trial. It's actually accruing really well. I've put patients on it too. Um, and it's for T1 or T2 and zero anal cancers. Um, their standard arm is the sort of standard doses of chemo radiation that we give. But on the de-intensified, if you randomize to that, it's lower radiation doses and one cycle of mitomycin. Um, SWAG is accruing well, and the study uh, will probably be closed in about a year. So thank you. The second trial uh, is uh, Dr. Van Morris is our, our champion here and our lead investigator, Dr. Kathy Ings in the audience, and that's uh, ECOG Akron 2176. And this is a phase three study of looking at uh, checkpoint inhibition with chemotherapy as the experimental arm versus the standard of carbo and uh, taxol for metastatic treatment naive anal cancer patients. Also accruing super well. Anal, anal trials accrue very well because usually there's only one uh, for local. Right now we have none and a couple for metastatic. So uh, SWAG, keep on uh, moving the enrollment, uh, but the study's about half done. On that. Sure. Uh, the carbo is just plan shortage. Um, so we just turned the turn patient away this past week because we uh, replaced our prior patient schema, only having two weeks to run. Uh, we could not consent the patient. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if it's an East versus West Coast thing. It hasn't hit at least New York yet, but I've heard you're not the first on, on this coast that I've heard this from. Dr. Dr. Ng's going to the microphone. No. <laughs> um, ECOG's putting out a, 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 a memo and ASCO's putting out a memo. Um, which And so, you know, I think a lot of places aren't necessarily experiencing that yet, but we just want to kind of remind people that obviously it's, you know, not everyone's going to be on exactly for six months, right? So, um, I don't really have another answer other than, you know, they're giving guidance. Want to get your classes? Are they on the floor? No, I got them. I didn't see the monitor down here. So I was like squinting at the computer. So you've heard about the Janus trial already. Um, please accrue. I, it is accruing very well, despite the fact that it just opened right before the holidays. And I wanted to review today uh, a new trial that uh, we're sponsoring in SWAG and uh, many of us uh, helped to write it. And this is uh, gonna be uh, from the Cana our Canadian colleague group, but again, SWAG will support it and our champion will be Stacy Cohen. And this is the NEO trial and it's looking at new adjuvant chemo um, versus chemo radiation uh, for early stage rectal cancer and organ preservation with local excision. 
So here's the schema. Um, again, uh, early stage rectal cancer, and then they're going to get randomized to a standard of chemo radiation. And I have a question about this, but I'll wait till I go through the schema. Um, and then versus three months of uh, modified full FOX or KBOX, the primary endpoint, just like Janus, is clinical complete response. And then they go to local excision. Um, with a, a very rigorous uh, observation, again, similar to the Janus trial, with a combo of MR, endo uh, exam, and CAT scan. So my, my question is, before I go through a few more slides on the study is, and I don't know if we have a radiation oncologist in the audience, but I'll open it up to everyone, is on Janus, the, the dose is 54 gray. Now, mind you, these are a little bit more aggressive rectal cancers, but you know, the endpoint's all about organ preservation. And I will say when when I when I treat with chemo radiation, I also use 54 gray for organ preservation intent. However, <laughs> before the Janus was even sort of a thing, this trial was written with 50 gray. And now we have an opportunity right before we send it for our final uh, to uh, CTEP like any day now to change it. So what do folks think? Now, again, these are early stage, but if if we're trying to sort of make this similar to the Janus um, and it's the standard arm versus three months of chemo, I'm I'm sort of questioning it now after I like just finished writing it for 50. Thoughts, anyone? Uh, show of hands, keep it at 50. Uh, oh. <laughs> 54 gray, any more hands? Are we going to have like, oh, well, all right, a couple more. I mean, honestly, I don't really notice a toxicity difference with two extra fractions of radiation these days. So, all right, I'll take that back to the study team when we, we meet early next week. So thank you. Um, and, and this study is based on results uh, from the our Canadian colleagues in a single arm uh, that's that's being published right now and presented already at ASCO of this modified shorter course of chemotherapy um, and then local excision. And so far with over two years of follow-up, they only have a local recurrence rate of about 7%. Um, so I think I talked about this uh, already. And for stats, um, the assumption is that with chemo radiation, uh, you get about a 40% clinical complete response rate. And so to, to sort of stat this uh, equivalent to the chemo, it'll take about 210 patients. And then I just wanted to end with saying that the whole goal is we were trying to have an early stage organ preservation trial to kind of go with the more advanced stage organ preservation trial of Janus. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question. <coughs> what about patients who don't have a complete response? But they cross yeah, so I didn't go through it all. So, so they'll get a period of, of observation to see if it you know, gets any better because sometimes this takes a couple months and if it doesn't, then they'll go to a, a standard surgery. Okay, any other questions? These are very, very interesting trials. Yeah, and and honestly, if if anyone has any feedback, like actively writing it on the plane right now to finish it, so we still have time to incorporate it, and I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Safe travels. Okay, so uh, next, I'd like to um, invite um, uh, Anthony or Rashna. How do you want to do it? And Sai, you can you can all come here. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm happy to present the hepatobiliary cancer subcommittee slides and. Uh, I'm obviously here representing uh, Anthony and myself, as well as Sai, uh, who is our surgical co-chair. 
so we thought we would just start with uh, reminding everybody where we're at in both HCC and biliary cancers. For those of you who uh, were at GI ASCO 2022, this made the big splash. This is the Topaz study, which is the first thing to really topple the frontline standard of care in over a decade, GEMSYS versus GEMSYS plus Dervalimab, so adding IO to a chemotherapy backbone. This was over 608, uh, 680 pa 685 patients, and the primary endpoint was median overall survival with a statistically significant improvement from 11.5 months to 12.6 months and a hazard ratio of 0.8. And as you can see, the landmark OS is here. There's a nice separation of the curves that stays separated. The updated survival came out at ESMO 2022, and it did seem like this is persistent and consistent. Median OS of 12.9 months versus 11.3 months. Uh, please keep in mind in this study, GEMSYS was discontinued after six months. So there's a Duralimab maintenance component to this. So it was a, a really interesting study for a lot of our patients who have been who get a lot of GEMSYS up front. Um, and then when we looked at some of the subgroup analyses across the board, there seemed to be a favoring of the addition of Dervalimab to gemcitabine and cisplatin. Now, since then, we've had a really exciting uh, kind of confirmatory study in terms of really uh, underscoring the importance of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy in biliary cancers. This is the Keynote 966 study that just read out of AACR this year. This was, again, a randomized study of GEMSYS PEMBRO versus GEMSYS plus placebo. And in this study, the maintenance was actually gemcitabine with pembrolizumab. So not just continuing the IO alone, but continuing chemotherapy plus IO uh, with gemcitabine alone. Primary endpoint was overall survival here. And as you can see uh, in the patient uh, characteristics, this was predominantly intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas as, tend to, as we tend to see in biliary tract cancers. And about 45% of patients were enrolled in Asia. Here, the, this is the OS data, and you can see here the median OS of PEMBRO with GEMSYS was 12.7 months versus 10.9 months. Uh, this was statistically significant with, again, the landmark 12-month and 24-month rates listed here. Um, and then when we look at response in both Topaz and Keynote, we're looking at responses in the 27 to 29% range, basically. So GEMSYS, historically, ABCO2 was 23%. So we're still in the kind of mid 20% range for biliary cancers. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, the other big uh, presentation came out from SWOG. Uh, SWOG 1815 read out this year at GI ASCO. This was our frontline study, GEMSYS NAB Paclitaxel versus GEMSYS randomized in a two-to-one fashion. Uh, there was 441 planned patients. And again, as you can see here, the majority of patients were intrahepatic. Two-thirds of patients were intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and then an even split between gallbladder cancer and extrahepatic diseases. Uh, and uh, about three quarters of patients were metastatic versus locally advanced. This was the OS. Uh, the gap regimen was 14 months median OS. GEMSYS alone was 12.7 months. PFS was 8.2 months versus 6.4 months. So neither of these were statistically significantly improved. Uh, when we did some exploratory analyses looking at uh, survival by disease site, there was um, no statistically significant differences between GAP and, and GEMSYS, but there was a trend towards better survival in the gallbladder cancer patients. But of course, numbers are small. This was not statistically powered to ask those questions. Uh, and when we looked again at disease stage, locally advanced versus metastatic, the GAP regimen uh, led to a median OS of 19.2 months in the locally advanced patients versus 13.7 months. So again, interesting signal, but very small numbers. Response rate, uh, overall response rate was 31% with the triplet versus 22% with the disease control rate of 77%. So SWOG, uh, SWOG 1815's ga adverse events demonstrated that this was a, uh, this is a tough regimen. It's triplet. It's a triplet chemotherapy regimen. So myelosuppressive effects, as we would expect with anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia, meaning being the primarily, primary adverse events. Um, and then the other uh, uh, AEs are listed here. Uh, so neg negative study, some interesting questions to ask, and a lot of biospecimen that's been collected with some uh, potential studies that we can look at and really better understand the patients, the 452 patients that were enrolled. When we look at the standard of care in the second line setting, uh, ABC06 kind of is really the bar. This is full FOX um, in, versus active symptom control in second line patients after gemcitabine-based therapy. And uh, as you can see, really low bar in the second line space, median OS of 5.3 months versus 6.2 months. So the addition of full FOX added a little over, a little less than a month in terms of median OS. 
Um, so it really kind of became the standard of care. We've also been looking at Naliri, uh, so nanoliposomal arenotecan with 5-FU compared to 5-FU. This is the NIFTI data that was presented at ESMO uh, last year and then has subsequently been published in JAMA Oncology. Here you can see uh, that there's some, again, kind of an intriguing signal, median OS 5.3 months versus 8.6 months, um, PFS of 1.7 months versus 4.2 months, suggesting some utility for the Naliri uh, 5-FU regimen in second-line patients. Uh, however, the German group subsequently presented, this is Arndt, uh, Arndt Vogel's data, looking at, um, again, 5-FU Naliri versus uh, 5-FU alone. And here, this was actually kind of a, a negative looking study, but again, just supporting the, the potential for arena tecan based regimens in the second line setting. So with that, uh, I just want to kind of quickly go through some of the studies that we have um, across the NCTN that are opening. Um, you, we've got a number of concepts in development within SWOG and other studies, but the, this is the Alliance study. This is going to be part of the CombiMatch study, CombiMatch program. This is full FOX plus or minus binimetinib in the second line setting with advanced biliary tract cancers with a planned 65 patients. This and basically al uh, allows for MAP kinase alterations, RAS, RAP, MEK, ERK, mutated biliary cancers. Um, who can receive full FOX. Uh, they're randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive full FOX plus Binny versus full FOX alone. Primary endpoint here is overall survival. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shergill uh, from the University of Chicago is the study chair, uh, but of course we'll be championing, championing this through SWOG as well. Uh, and then we have an, a study in development from our own, uh, Dr. Kim. This is a randomized phase two trial that will be looking again in second line patients, specifically in KRAS mutated biliary tract cancer. So these are going to be patients who've had one line of therapy and have a KRAS alteration, KRAS mutation. They're going to be randomized. We just had a, a nice, robust conversation around this this morning. Uh, and so the, the decision is really going to be to look at Naliri 5-FU with um, uh, uh, on Vicertinib. And the primary objective here is progression free survival. And then we have our opt-in study. So this is Dr. Mythel's study from uh, ECOG Akron. This is looking at perioperative approaches to incidentally found gallbladder cancer. Uh, this is a study that basically takes an incidental gallbladder cancer and randomizes patients to receiving surgery up front, which is our traditional approach, versus preoperative gemcitabine and cisplatin, uh, and then going on uh, to uh, uh, subsequent surgery. And so, and then uh, afterwards, the, there's uh, adjuvant gem cis. So again, kind of asking the question of, is there a potentially a benefit to receiving some neoadjuvant gemcitabine-based chemotherapy in our incidentally found gallbladder cancer patients? Uh, this study has also been really smartly amended to allow for gem cis to be delivered locally, which I think is really important. And so we really encourage uh, everyone to open, open the study and support it. Now, in the hepatocellular space, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, can, I, can I interrupt? If you know? So for the Naliri, uh, the second line, uh, what what do people use in the uh, community by and large? What, do you know? In the second line setting in yeah. Naliri? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Naliri or Folfox or Folfiri? Yeah, it's. I would say it's primarily probably Folfox, just given the, you know, the randomized phase three study, but those of us who like, I mean, a lot of people like to give everybody a platinum break. And so there's a fair number of people who, based on retrospective data with full theory, as well as now the nifty nifty data, a fair number of people, and it's now in the guidelines that are using Naliri 5-FU. But I, I welcome hearing it from the audience if there's- Does anyone want to challenge that, the use of Naliri? Challenge me, please. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's obviously especially true in our extra hepatics and, and maybe some, some sometimes the gallbladder cancer patients. Very true. Uh, the other question I had was the ECOG trial, uh, the gallbladder, that's occurring very slowly. Am I correct? Yes, I, <laughs> I, I knew Flav was about to get up. Um, it, it is accruing slowly. I, I do think that some of the tweaks, uh, Flav, I think, I mean, other than the amendment made to allow for kind of gemsis locally, I, there was a couple other tweaks made, right? Yeah. So I think um, the other change was that uh, T1Bs are now going to be included. So it initially was just T2, T3, but I do think that one is going to be the bigger change that's going to affect the cruel. Um, I think we have about 39 patients at this point out of yeah. 176 or so. Wow. Yeah, last I checked, it was in the high 30s. Yeah. And, um, okay. 
All right. And then just very quickly in HCC. So obviously this is our frontline space right now in HCC. We've got the Atezo Bev data from Embrave 150, as well as the Himalaya data looking at stride, one pop of tremolimumab followed by durvalumab. Um, these are, you know, head to head, quote unquote, comparisons, even though you're not supposed to do that. Uh, but I would say these are the two primary regimens we're using in the frontline space. The only really kind of big update that came actually again out of AACR this year was the Imbrave 050. This is the adjuvant study looking at patients who have undergone uh, curative resection or ablation and then are randomized one to one to receive adjuvant atezobev versus active surveillance. And in this study, um, you can see that this was, uh, again, kind of a, a heavily Asian uh, patient population that was enrolled uh, and uh, primarily hepatitis B patient population. So as, as we tend to see in a lot of our HCC studies, you know, there's a bimodal uh, peak when it comes to recurrence for HCC. There's kind of one really early on, and then there's one that's much later. So they specifically picked a recurrence-free survival endpoint. Um, and this is the initial data that was reported out looking at in, in um investigator reviewed and assessed our RFS. And basically what you see here is that the uh, the uh, RFS was significantly improved with the Tezobev versus active surveillance. Um, the overall survival data is very immature. There's only uh, 47 patients with any sort of event at this point. Uh, I think it's important to point out just as we start to understand and digest this data, there were seven more deaths in the Tezobev arm versus surveillance. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll obviously eagerly await maturation of the overall survival data to really understand this. And this is the safety data you would, uh, basically the side effects that you would expect to see from a Tezobev were seen in the adjuvant patient population as well. Again, just pointing out that there was grade five AEs that were, um, you know, small numbers, but six in the uh, Atezobev arm versus one in the active surveillance arm. And so just for everyone to, you know, we really want to encourage engagement. We've been trying to plan a hepatobiliary subcommittee retreat, but calendaring that has been hard. Uh, but please, I'll be on the lookout for that because we really are trying to prioritize. This is a rapidly changing field in the space of hepatobiliary diseases. And we are really trying to make sure that SWOG has a huge role in that. Um, SWOG 1815, I think, is a perfect example of how, you know, important of a role SWOG can play in this space. Uh, so when it comes to biliary cancers uh, and hepatocellular, we'll see that, you know, Dr. al Khwari, myself, Dr. Ahmad, and a number of others have con uh, have discussed that we really think looking at perioperative approaches in these spaces is going to be really important as we develop more and more novel therapeutics. The obvious question becomes, is there a role for them in the perioperative space? Um, obviously, in the targeted therapy world of biliary cancers, we're obviously interested in that space as well, but there's a lot happening in the industry realm. So both Dr. al Khwari and I feel like it's really maybe these the all comer studies, especially in these locally advanced, unresectable and or advanced uh, second line and beyond setting that we can think through in the biliary cancer world. And same with hepatocellular, just perioperative neoadjuvant uh, is really kind of where our, our interest lies. So if you have ideas and concepts, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask you, uh, in terms of the perioperative or the adjuvant, do you think it should be a... Um at Isobev, or it should be uh, talking about HCC or a uh, immune combo. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think if you look at practice patterns, Atezobev continues to remain the quote unquote champion. Now we have Embrave 050 that's going to suggest that, I mean, at least for now, looks like it's going to become the standard. Are you impressed? In the are you that, that much impressed by the Embrave 050? No. I'm not, but that's yeah. that's my take. <laughs> I think it's too early. I think it's for us to really understand what what Atezobev in the in the uh, adjuvant space is going to do. Yes, Dr. Roca. Yeah, no, I was just going to add that um, you know the we should have the adjuvant um, Pembro data as well coming out. It was just a press release, so we'll see what that looks like. Um, but I, in my opinion, I think perioperative, you know, as first the adjuvant is probably the best strategy because if you control the neoadjuvant, you'll control the adjuvant as well. Right. Yeah. Spoken like a surgeon. And, and again, uh, I think having a um, retreat because of the many uh, many uh, options for clinical trials and questions, and, um, and anyone is really um, invited to really provide any input. Absolutely, and, uh, so. absolutely. We, especially young junior investigators, we would love to to hear from you. Absolutely. Any other questions um, about the biliary and um, uh, anything to do with it? No. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, ju I just want to um, thank you very much. 
Uh, I just want to take a, a, a minute break to um, really thank a number of people who are hel helping us in our um, in our work in the SWAT committee clinical trials. There's a lot of work that uh, goes there. I would like to thank uh, Christy. I don't know if I can see you, Christy. Christy is our um, uh, our coordinator. She does everything for us. And uh, she gets involved with the writing the protocols, kind of. And she she works on uh, <laughs> on keeping us. Uh, uh, we have timelines for projects, so she's a project coordinator, and she does she does everything. So we thank you very much, Christy, for all of, all your work. But they can't see you, so you need to stand. So uh, thank you, Christy, for everything you do. But also, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, Dr. Catherine Guthrie. Guthrie, Catherine, are you here? I, I can't see. Oh, here, here. Where there she is at the back. So she's our lead statistician for the for the committee, and also uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, uh, Sarah Colby. I don't know if she's here. Sarah, are you here? Okay, so we have a great team and um, we have uh, a lot of meetings per month. I can tell you, we do a lot of that. Um, it just um, can be very, very challenging sometimes to get these studies through. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we can go next to our next committee. And uh, I'd like to invite, uh, who's coming, Phil or um, Marwan or Sepp? Sure, there's plenty of room here. Yeah, absolutely. What is SEP? All right. Okay. You also. So, uh, so we'll get started on the colon subcommittee. Uh, we've got a pretty full uh, agenda to go through. We're going to uh, lead off with some uh, recent highlights uh, that Dr. Uh, Faki is going to present. Oh, you got this. Right. Thank you, Phil. Um, really, not a lot uh, since the last meeting. I just want to cover the. Uh, uh, data from the sunlight trial that was presented uh, a few months ago. So this has been uh, basically released in the New England Journal of Medicine maybe three days ago. Um, and the highlight of this is that the uh, addition of bevacizumab to uh, trifluridine in a third line setting, this was mandated only up to two lines of therapy. Uh, patients previously progressed following oxaliplatin, 5 or tcan Majority had bevacizumab about 70%, and you can see the PFS is 5.6 months with uh, trifluridine bev versus 2.4 months. And the OS went up from 7.5 months with trifluridine to 10.8 months, as you can see on the uh, right. So it does appear that we do have a new standard of care in the third line setting. I think there's a filing for FDA approval. Uh, this has been an NCCN guideline for a while. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the pre-BEV, uh, BEV pre-treated versus non-BEV pre-treated, and certainly the hazard ratio appears to be more favorable for the BEV naive patients, but the, the benefits are seen across the board in this patient population. So uh, may affect the, the subsequent randomization plans and third line setting uh, as far as control arms. Um, you know, as far as IO for uh, microsatellite stable colon cancer, this is the study that was presented by uh, uh, Anthony, by Dr. Alquiri, uh a few months ago, again, at the GI ASCO, and um, uh, a very uh, interesting combination of botencilimab plus balstilimab uh, in patients with uh, microsatellite stable colorectal cancer. Uh, botencilimab um, is an FC-engineered uh, CTLA-4, um, FC enhanced, and it has apparently uh, more uh, activity than uh, expected with ipilimumab, also has a different toxicity profile uh, than ipilimumab, and balstilimab is a PD-1 inhibitor. 
so the combination has been evaluated in MSS CRC patients. Uh, this is the third update or fourth actually update on this clinical trial at uh, GI ASCO, and they they basically look at the responses and and PFFs uh, in the in the overall population, and you can see the waterfall plot is. It's really interesting with a 23% overall response in the uh, overall population. Mind you, when you when you kind of look at the non-liver metastases, the response rates are much higher, and there were no objective responses in patients with liver metastatic disease. Here you can see the overall responses, and very similar to what we had seen previously with Rego and Epi as well, as far as the differentiation and outcome. Look at the red line, that's the overall survival with botencilimab, bolstilimab. This is again, uh, pre-treated um, MSSCRC uh, who had progressed on uh, standard chemotherapy and the overall response rate had not been reached. Um, uh, patients um, with active liver metastases uh, is the blue line. And you can see that the, the median overall survival uh, is not favorable. It appears to be around nine months or so. Um, so where are we with um, um, MSS CRC? Uh, I don't know if um, if all of you had seen this press release. This is the LEAP 017, Lenvatinib, Pembrolizumab versus standard of care. The interesting thing about the study is that it was stratified for liver metastases versus non-liver metastases. The data is not reported yet, but as, as you can see highlighted on the slide, the, the pre-specified analysis of OS there was a trend of improvement uh, with Keytruda plus lenvatinib versus rigorafenib uh, or versus DAS-102. However, these results did not meet statistical significance per the pre-specified statistical analysis plan. So it does not appear that lenvatinib pembro will be uh, a, a standard of care. And we're, we're still kind of uh, at this point with uh, rigorafenib, uh, trifluoridine, but more likely trifluoridine bevacizumab. Uh, Stellar 303 is ongoing. Uh, that's as that's XL092, which is the um, you know uh, improved cabozatinib plus atezolizumab versus rigorafenib, and the Activate trial is the follow-up study from Agenis, and uh, and that's a very interesting study because they're seeking accelerated approval uh, for botencilimab, bolstilimab, likely supported by this study, and uh, it will be looking at botencilimab plus bolstilimab. Uh, at two different doses of botencilimab um, versus botencilimab alone at a, at, at a higher dose and botencilimab alone at a lower dose versus trifluoridine monotherapy. Um, so I, I think this study is de de designed to kind of show contribution of components. Um, there's really not enough data on CTLA-4 inhibition alone with botencilimab, and therefore they had to include those arms, but we don't have good efficacy data on the botencilimab monotherapy. Um, so um, th those were the highlights I wanted to give. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Maybe we can we can take in questions. We've already touched upon uh, segment two here. Uh, we've uh, here are the PACES slide, the PACES slides, uh, the study that's closing this June, the prevention trial. Uh, next is uh, we want to discuss is the COMMIT trial. This is for patients with untreated metastatic colon cancer who harbor mismatch repair deficiency. And uh, the final schema is uh, Fulfox and Avastin with atezolizumab versus atezolizumab alone. It's been occurring very slowly, 92 patients, and uh, they just uh, redesigned the sample size to 120 patients. So hopefully within the next uh, year to 18 months, this trial will be completed. Uh, the CIRCULATE trial has recently opened. Uh, it's still getting uh, underway at many different sites. And here we are using CTDNA to help prescribe the therapy. Patients in whom there is no circulating tumor DNA uh, will be randomized to full Fox versus serial surveillance with circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and in those patients where it is detected, they'll be randomized to an intensification of chemotherapy versus standard chemotherapy. Um, this slide just highlights the recently presented GALAXY trial showing the prognostic implications of minimal residual disease. And uh, you can see that in patients who harbor uh, circulating tumor DNA, uh, that giving chemotherapy 
that's the blue line versus uh, on the left graph versus no chemo can uh, result in considerable improvement. Patients who are signatory negative, you can see that there's not much difference with the addition of chemotherapy. How that will impact the circular trial is there it's simply amending the trial to uh, facilitate enrollment and even allowing up to one prior cycle of therapy. We have a couple of recently closed uh, studies that I'll mention very briefly. Anderson, when was circulate activated? Uh, less than a year ago. Oh, do you think the accrual is okay? Uh, I think it's slow, but it's uh, once again, there were some holdups with terms of the amendments that have to get done. It's working its way still through the IRBs. Um, recently closed trials. Uh, so this was our uh, trial of phase two study from Dr. Raghav of trastuzumab and uh, pertuzumab versus cetuximab and arinitikan in patients with HER2 amplification. Uh, this trial have a, I won't dwell on the number of battles it had to go through with respect to uh, laboratory certification several times, the pandemic, it went on and on. Um, but uh, ultimately it did finish and uh, an abstract was presented at GI ASCO uh, this uh, last few months ago. We'll be awaiting a final report. The ATOMIC trial, um, this is an adjuvant immunotherapy trial. Patients with resected stage three colon cancer randomly assigned to standard of care chemotherapy with or without uh, the addition of atezolizumab. That study has now completed and we'll be awaiting that report. Uh, what's not on here that should have been is the SOLARIS trial. Uh, that was a, a trial randomizing patients with untreated metastatic colon cancer to Fulfox and Avastin in varying doses of vitamin D, uh, and that uh, has just closed. Uh, finally, we'll just mention a, a few concepts that are in development. Um, Drs. Krishnamurthy and Sentil are working on neoadjuvant chemotherapy in high-risk microsatellite stable colon cancer. Uh, Dr. Faki is uh, working on a phase two slash three trial of regorafenib um, and ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with lung predominant disease with the exclusion of liver metastasis. Uh, Dr. Golami is working on a, a trial in patients with resectable hepatic metastasis, whether intensification of chemotherapy is helpful. She's also working on a platform study using immune augmenting agents in the uh, management of patients with colorectal liver metastasis. Today, we heard about a, a high-grade appendicillin carcinoma study from Drs. Patel and Deneen, uh, and that was under discussion this morning. Uh, from the uh, task force, uh, we have an adjuvant BRAF trial uh, that's going to be opening in the near future, and uh, as well as a systemic therapy with or without hepatic arterial infusion of floxuridine trial that will be opening uh, in the very near future as well. So we'll be awaiting updates on those studies. Uh, very briefly, this is the POETIC trial. This is Dr. Krishnamurthy and Sentil study uh, where patients uh, with uh, high-risk uh, stage uh, three colon cancer, including uh, high-risk stage T4 tumors, will be randomly assigned between standard of care surgery followed by adjunct chemotherapy, uh, preoperative Fulfox, followed by surgery, then further chemotherapy. And then the experimental arm, whether the addition of one dose of ipilimumab and two doses of nivolumab will impact the outcome uh, in these patients. And that study uh, uh, continues to be in the planning stages, and we are awaiting uh, the results of a colon task force survey, which will be out on Tuesday this coming week. Any, any comments about the study? Any questions? So this is a neoadjuvant trial in stage three colon cancer. Um, how do people feel about putting patients um, in a study like this? Yeah, please. How do, how do you get to T3 preoperatively? Like, what? How do you stage that? So there are a variety of radiologic. Repeat the question. So the question is, how do we know what T stage the patient has? So there are actually pretty well-defined criteria that are coming into practice with more and more frequency. And uh, there will be central review. And I think uh, Flavio 
just to make a comment from the surgical perspective. Yeah, I think um, two things on the on the uh, this kind of follows in the Foxtrot, you know, uh, platform. That's how they identified their um, their T uh, threes with that inclusion. I think this is one trial where you're really going to need to have the surgeon buy in here, especially since most colon cancer is being done in the community. So I think it kind of behooves us to to get that education out there because again, those patients are going to see the surgeon first potentially before the uh, the oncologist. So. You know, we were able to shift the paradigm across many other diseases, uh, such as breast cancer. I think that uh, we'll have to get the job done in colon cancer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, Marwan, do you want to comment on this? Uh, yes, thank you. So we, we're redesigning the... Uh, uh, REN uh, uh, protocol. Um, REN has been shown to show um, a had shown a PFS of five months, response rate thirty six percent. Just go with the first slide, uh, not this one here. We're going to stick with option one. Uh, but basically, previously we were uh, considering remind people what REN stands for. Yeah, REN stands for Rigo Epinivo, and we recently reported response rate of thirty six percent, PFS of five months. <laughs> an MSS CRC that is refractory to chemotherapy with an OS of more than two years and patients without liver meds. Um, Rego and Evo prior to that had a lower response rate and a PFS of three and a half months. With the negative trial from LEAP17, we do not think that we need to do a comparison between REN and Rego and Evo to take it forward and compare it to standard of care. So the question is, REN better than trifluoridine BAV? Uh, and this design is looking at these two combinations in a randomized phase two study. Um, this is not finalized at this point. Based on the debate this morning, we are going to focus on a randomized phase two with a crossover design with the trifluoridine BEV going on to REN uh, and focus on the PFS and the randomized phase two. Uh, we feel that adding a phase three component may take the study too long. Uh, and may be hindered by the botanzolimab, bolstolimab data in a couple of years from now. So uh, that's where we are. And um, Sep, do you want to comment on your concept? Sure. Yeah, this is um, a trial in which we're looking at um, patients with resectable liver-only metastases, um, even um, including matters in metachronous colorectal liver metastases or synchronous colorectal uh, colon liver metastases um, that are MSS cancers only with four or fewer lesions at this point. And um, the concept is to really compare the use of full fox theory versus um, full fox in a perioperative setting um, with um, specifically also looking at um, serial ctDNA and the specific dynamics in a prospective fashion. Um, the primary outcome is DFS and the secondary outcome will be looking at um, path responses, immune cell filtration, ctDNA dy dynamics, and really interesting qualitative um, um, studies, including um, OS and overall response rates. Um, the stratification factors so far are location of primary tumor and the B, um, RAS and BRAF mutation. And then uh, this is the uh, schema, for just the concept that we reviewed in a preliminary fashion today. Uh, for patients with high-grade appendiceal cancers undergoing a staging laparoscopy to determine that their PCI or peritoneal carcinomatosis index scores within the defined range, and then randomizing between chemotherapy or going straight to surgery. And uh, that's still under discussion. Uh, finally, Sep, if you could comment on erasure, which very recently opened. Yeah, so um, Erasure is actually um, recently open at several um, institutions, and I know there's like over 50 like um, that are so currently trying to activate this. Um, this is a patient with newly diagnosed um, uh, metastatic colorectal cancer, and essentially with um, multiple sites of disease, not not just resectable or liver only diseases here um, that are MSS, BRAF, wild type. Um, and uh, essentially looking at the comparison of systemic um, therapy uh, as a standard arm compared to systemic plus uh, total ablative therapies. And um, this is this will be really interesting because I think the um, the really the question is that a lot of these patients in the community are sort of treated off protocol with various, you know, local, regional like therapies and really the still we don't really have an answer whether that is better compared to standard of care. So that's really, I think as a the primary endpoint is overall survival. 
um, secondary endpoints are listed there. Um, and then to notice, so anyone who hasn't opened this, please, um, we really would love for you to open this trial if possible. Thanks, Seth. Before we conclude the colon section, um, I'd like to know if uh, any of the patient advocates that are in the audience would like to comment on any of the uh, three uh, proposed trials that we have that are very close to getting done and going to uh, through the process of being uh, activated. The first being the POETIC trial, where we're uh, having that third arm of immunotherapy and the preoperative management of colon cancer. Anything from our advocates? Yeah, maybe we don't have anyone. Maybe we don't have anyone here. Okay. Are there any advocates in the audience? No. Okay. Okay. Well, that concludes the colon presentation. If there are any questions, we're happy to address them now. Otherwise, thanks for your attention. Um, in, the, in the colon space, are there any studies that you guys are interested in for us to, to see if we can, uh, any, any important questions, clinical questions, other than what we obviously discussed? Okay. 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 Um, I'm presenting esophageal gastric subcommittee on behalf of Zeb Weinberg and myself. I'm just going to same format, go over the current updates, the active trials through NCTN. Um, the, we have a SWOG concept that was just recently approved, and then we have a concept that's been in development and is being resurrected and revised. Uh, so in terms of updates, the past year, uh, we had uh, Checkmate 649, which established nivolumab as a standard of care in combination with chemotherapy for patients with CPS score of five or greater. The two-year survival data was presented, um, which uh, was list listed as such, 28 versus 19% for chemo alone. And then we had the Keynote 859 data, which was chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab, which was also uh, presented, uh, which actually looks very similar uh, to what was presented with Checkmate 649 with similar overall survival around 13 months for the patients who had immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy, a PFS of around seven months, um, and then the survival rates as listed, uh, which is all consistent with what we um, had seen. Um, in the perioperative setting, we have ongoing trials um, and some that have been completed. Uh, the addition of uh, immunotherapy to chemotherapy in the perioperative setting um, Attraction 5, there was a press release, we haven't seen um, the data yet, uh, which was unfortunately a negative study. This was an Asian trial uh, with adjuvant um, uh, uh, S1 or, uh, or capecitabine oxali. Um, Keynote 585 um, is pending. Um, hopefully we'll get some results here soon. And uh, Matterhorn, I believe, is continuing to accrue. So the exciting data this year was uh, uh, with Claudin 18.2 as a novel target. 18.2 um, uh, is a member of the Claudin family. Um, it's involved in, uh, it's a component of these tight junctions, cell cell adhesion. And during tumor genesis, the Claudin 18.2 receptor becomes exposed and thereby a potential target for the monoclonal antibody, Zolbituximab. So the spotlight trial was presented at GI ASCO. This was a global randomized um, placebo-controlled phase three trial, which randomized patients to zolbituximab plus chemotherapy um, versus uh, chemotherapy alone. And these were patients who were Claudin 18.2 positive. Um, the primary endpoint of the study was a progression-free survival with uh, secondary endpoints of overall survival. And this was a positive trial um, with uh, PFS of 10.6 uh, months uh, for the patients who received uh, zolbituximab plus chemo versus um, about eight and a half months for chemotherapy alone. So on uh, ongoing uh, phase three studies uh, globally, we have the FGF receptor target uh, fortitude trial, which is accruing. Um, the uh, LEAP15 actually uh, completed enrollment. This is with uh, uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy plus lenvatinib. Um, there's an ongoing trial with a uh, full FOX nivolumab versus um, the addition of a TIGIT to that combination. Um, and then in the second line setting, 
Uh, we don't actually know of any large randomized phase threes that are going on industry-wide for, for the second line setting in metastatic gastric cancer, um, but SWAG will have a trial, as you heard earlier, uh, for this patient population looking at immunotherapy beyond immunotherapy. Okay, so um, in terms of NCTN, um, there are three ongoing studies, uh, which we can go through those quickly. Uh, there's EA2174, which is a perioperative study. Uh, Jennifer Eads is leading, leading this. Um, it's essentially um, a two by two randomization for patients with localized disease to carboplatin paclitaxel versus carboplatin paclitaxel plus uh, nivolumab, um, followed by surgery, and then a second randomization to nivolumab versus nivolumab ipilimumab. Um, this trial has accrued really nicely. It's actually on hold right now. Uh, for assessment of the phase two portion, they, they've accrued um, close to 270 patients. Um, GI086 is continuing to accrue. Um, it's about uh, 130 patients. Um, this is essentially assessing the use of photon therapy in patients with localized disease. The study is led by Dr. Lin. Um, it's uh, carboplatin paclitaxel uh, photons versus standard of care. And then EA2183, this is um, a study that's uh, led by um, uh, Natalia Oboha, um, ECOG trial, which is a consolidated radiotherapy in patients with oligometastatic HER2 negative um, upper GI tumors. Um, these patients uh, with metastatic disease and no prior line of therapy um, receive induction chemotherapy for four months. Uh, if there's no evidence of progressive disease, they're then subsequently randomized to continuation of systemic chemotherapy uh, versus uh, consolidated radiation. And oligolometastatic disease is designed is defined as three or less sites. Uh, this this study has a was on hold for a while for an amendment uh, to, with the, to add immunotherapy to the front line. It's uh, only accrued about 16 patients. And then um, this trial uh, for metastatic patients, a randomized phase three trial looking at triplet chemotherapy in gastric cancer uh, that is modified full Farinox plus immunotherapy versus standard of care chemotherapy. Um, this trial uh, is has been approved, is going through the protocol activation process and should be open pretty soon here. Um, this is um, uh, straight randomized phase three and will accrue, I think over 300 patients, if I can see those numbers. And then uh, lastly, um, a trial that has also been approved by the GI steering committee and is uh, going through the protocol process is um, uh, Dr. Rajdev's uh, 2212, uh, which is an ECOG-led study, a randomized phase two trial of atezolizumab, plus or minus chemotherapy for patients with MSI high uh, gastric cancer. Um, so patients with MSI high disease will be randomized to chemotherapy plus atezolizumab versus atezolizumab alone. Um, this trial is looking is uh, phase two, a uh, randomized phase two, and is looking to accrue uh, 240 patients. What's the percentage of um, MSI high? It's low. Like? Uh, probably like 10, less than 10%. Less than 10%, yeah. And in terms of future development, um, so we have presented here multiple times uh, a perioperative concept for patients with uh, gastric uh, cancer, um, which we'd had some trouble uh, securing drug. Uh, we've resurrected this concept now looking at clotting um, 18.2 as a biomarker-directed therapy in um, in uh, the localized setting. Um, we're also uh, uh, continuing to pursue the uh, HER2 target, uh, hopefully with immunotherapy. That concept's being um, fleshed out further and we hope to have uh, that presented uh, clearly at the next meeting. Um, in terms of second line therapy, we have Dr. Said's concept, which you heard about, which is looking at a uh, nivolumab and uh, it, uh, added to ramucirumab plus paxil in the second line setting. And then where we clearly have an unmet need is the refractory setting. There really aren't a, um, large randomized trials going on right now in refractory uh, gastric cancer. So if anyone has ideas or drugs they want to bring forward to investigate, we are definitely open for business. Can I just ask a question about uh, the clothing 18.2? What is the status of, like, would it be possible in the hospitals? Now, is it becoming part of the 
Yeah. So they're developing a, 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 a the, they're rolling the, out their companion kit. So like you, at US, IHC, USC, do you do it? Um, we're getting the companion. I mean, I think once they get the FDA approval, yeah. they'll then they will then roll out the diagnostic kit at the same time. Okay. Because yeah, and it it has it will be IHC. I mean, this is going to become an issue for us. You know, we 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 have small amounts of tissue. We need her too, which is usually IHC. Then we need that's my and then we have NGS on top of that that we usually do for this patient population as well. So I think tissue is going to start being a problem for these patients, and we have to keep that in mind as we're biopsying them that we're going to need you know significant amounts to do all these various testing. And what will what is the percentage of patients who have uh, Claudine eighteen point two. It's around thirty percent, right? Huh? It's around thirty percent. Thirty percent. Yeah. So it's it's going to be an interesting. Uh, and if you have uh, Claudine eighteen point two positive and um, and also PDL. Well, yeah. So it's I, interesting. There's been conflicting data about that. So there were some early studies that were presented that said that these were fairly mutually exclusive, and that in fact perhaps um, there were populations that actually had. Uh, a CPS score of five or greater were low percentages who express both Claude and 18.2 and were PDL1 positive. Um, but actually, if you look at um, the recent data that's been presented, that's not the case. Um, and that is a more significant population. And in fact, of the Claude and 18.2 patients that were positive in a paper that was just presented, I, I think it was upwards of, it was close to 25% of those patients were also had a, a significant, uh, you know, a positive PDL1. So I, I think this is going to be an interesting dilemma now as to how to pay, how patients are going to want to move forward. Clearly, um, you know, going which down which pathway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any any questions? Any comments? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you. And la last but not least, uh, Dr. Dasari will be uh, discussing the neuroendocrine subcommittee. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of uh, John Strasberg uh, and myself. Uh, no major updates in the neuroendocrine field, um, so I'll jump right into the SWOG uh, concepts. Um, uh, net retreat uh, is a, a concept that's almost ready to be activated. Uh, I think we had a CRB uh, approval. Um, so this is uh, asking the question about the efficacy of retreatment with PRRT. Uh, in uh, patients who've received it and benefited from it before. So uh, this trial would enroll patients with medgut or small bowel neuroendocrine tumors uh, who had um, stable disease or better for at least 12 months uh, from the last uh, dose of PRRT. Uh, and uh, these patients would be uh, randomized to uh, a PRRT uh, again for two doses uh, versus uh, everolimus. Uh, and the everolimus arm is allowed to cross over at the time of uh, progression. Uh, the primary endpoint is uh, disease-free uh, survival, uh, and the total sample size is about 100. This is being co-led by SWOG uh, and CCTG. Uh, with regards to uh, ongoing NCTN uh, trials, uh, the cabinet trial been uh, open for, for a while. Uh, probably the only uh, kind of global study, I mean, study globally that's actually looking at a VEGF uh, TKI in carcinoid uh, tumors currently. Um, so this is a randomized uh, study of cabozantinib versus placebo in patients uh, with advanced uh, NET. Uh, so uh, pa patients are enrolled onto two separate uh, cohorts, pancreatic NET and carcinoid randomized two to one uh, to cabozantinib uh, versus uh, placebo. The uh, primary endpoint is uh, progression-free uh, survival. Uh, it's being led out of uh, Alliance and uh, John Strasberg is the uh, SWOG champion. Uh, it's uh, been open uh, around, I think, uh, over uh, five years now. Uh, and with regards to uh, enrollment, um, but uh, Almost there, uh, total enrollment of about 400. We're close to uh, 300 now. Uh, this is kind of a trial in a rare uh, tumor type. Um, it's uh, in patients with a pheochromocytoma uh, or paraganglioma. It's a phase two trial evaluating the activity of temozo temozolamide uh, with uh, or without oliparib. Uh, 
uh, and patients are randomized again two to one to the uh, experimental arm versus the uh, control arm of uh, temozolomide. Um, this is also being led out of uh, Alliance, and this walk champion is Dr. Lopez. Uh, total enrollment of about 76 patients, and we're about 22. The enrollment has picked up uh, lately. So uh, good to see that and hoping to see further uh, improvement. The next couple of trials um, are actually kind of asking the question of uh, PRRT versus standard of care in a couple of different uh, primary sites. Uh, the first is uh, the uh, Alliance trial that's looking at uh, PRRT uh, versus Everolimus in lung uh, nets. Um, and uh, it's really struggled quite a bit uh, with uh, uh, regards to uh, enrollment. And there's a lot of discussion uh, at the task force about uh, this trial. Uh, the four enrollments we see are very recent. So hoping that this will continue and the plan is to reassess the enrollment again uh, in about six months or so. Uh, similar uh, kind of uh, design, uh, but uh, in kind of patients with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, so PRRT uh, versus um, standard of care of uh, capecitabine temozolomide uh, with the primary endpoint of PFS as well. Uh, it is being co-led by uh, Alliance and SWOG. The SWOG PI is uh, Dr. Suarez. Uh, and again, another uh, study that was really critically reviewed with regards to enrollment and the four enrollments you see are also recent, uh, total enrollment of uh, 200. I just want to uh, end by highlighting some of the ongoing uh, trials uh, globally uh, to kind of give you a taste of what's coming. The first is the uh, Sorrento trial that's actually uh, kind of looking at a different formulation of octreotide that can be given subcutaneously. Uh, it's typically, typically given uh, intramuscularly. Uh, so it's comparing the subcutaneous uh, formulation to uh, octreotide IM versus uh, landreotide. And it's also would result in a, a higher dose of um, SSA as compared to the uh, control arms. So it's asking two uh, questions. Uh, this trial is currently ongoing. A lot of activity, as you can expect, uh, in the PRRT space. Uh, Netter 2, uh, that was a randomized uh, phase three trial uh, evaluating a first line PRRT uh, versus uh, high dose octreotide uh, in patients uh, with um, grade two or three uh, um, uh, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in the first line. It has finished enrollment. And we are hoping that we'll have the results uh, sometime uh, this year. The COMPETE trial um, has also finished enrollment. It's a phase three uh, global study uh, with uh, patients having grade one or two gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, and this is looking at uh, lutetium edotriotide, uh, which is kind of a slightly uh, different uh, formulation of uh, PRRT. Uh, versus uh, Everolimus, and this is in the uh, second line uh, setting. So it's mostly done in Europe, so very few centers in US had this trial open, has finished um, uh, enrollment uh, as well. The uh, COMPOSE trial uh, is also using the uh, same uh, uh, kind of, uh, PRRT uh, compound, um, but in this, uh, trial kind of patients with more aggressive neuroendocrine uh, tumors, so grade uh, two or three are being enrolled, and they can be enrolled either in first line or second line, with the uh, control arm being kind of physician's choice of uh, treatment. And this trial is uh, open and uh, enrolling. And finally, kind of really uh, a trial that a lot of uh, people are excited about and looking at a novel agent is the ACTION-1 trial. Uh, this is looking at an alpha emitter, uh, so uh, actinium-225 uh, PRRT uh, versus standard of care. This is a phase 1b3 uh, trial, uh, enrolling patients with uh, get nets who have received prior PRRT uh, and so and have progressed. And these patients would be enrolled onto this trial uh, as subsequent uh, therapy. Uh, the trial has finished the phase 1b uh, portion, uh, so waiting to 
uh, move on to the uh, phase three uh, portion. Um, I'm, I'm just interested to see that you're using, uh, not you, but the PRRT in patients who have grade two or three um, tumors, I mean, three, if, if it's FDG positive, would you still think they will respond? Yeah, great question. And um, I, so uh, I think all these trials would mandate uh, that they have uh, up, uh, enough uptake on a dotatate scan. But, but not FDG. They don't check the FDG, do they? Uh, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what I was going to say. So what we know is that when we do both uh, FDG and dotatate scans, there tends to be a subset of patients who have heterogeneous uh, kind of uh, uptake with some areas being avid on a dota date scan, some areas being avid on a PET scan. So that uh, is more so in patients with higher KI-67, uh, especially grade threes, uh, as you said. Uh, there is some discussion in the uh, task force around designing trials uh, in that space, but a lot of logistical uh, kind of challenges um, in terms of you know, how do we get both scans uh, approved for patients in a timely fashion? And we still don't have kind of standardized criteria to uh, use the results from both these scans to really determine which patient should yeah. get what therapy. So uh, kind of ongoing discussion in the task force. Yeah, this is a really nice, a very nice summary of what's going on. Uh, any questions to Dr. Dasari? Um, Thank you, great job. And then, for some reason, I thought you're going to end the last. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that is so hard. Pancreas cancer is where drugs go to die. So I think Dr. Philip was trying to save us the embarrassment. Uh, this is our current NCTN portfolio for resectable disease where um, we have a couple of studies. Uh, we have, uh, I left a blank in the upper sort of row in metastatic disease. We have some uh, disease subset populations with trials, uh, but nothing for all comers. I'll go through the- For the sake of everyone, can you explain what RBR and UR are? Yes, resectable, borderline resectable, unresectable. Uh, in the non-metastatic setting, and then in metastatic, metastatic setting, first line and beyond first line. So this is what we have. Uh, the ECOG study, the giant trial of gemcitabine, NAPAC, titaxel compared to 5-fluorouracil nanoliposomal irinotecan. This is uh, older patients defined as age 70 or greater. And Dr. Zen is the SWOG champion. This has accrued uh, uh, a good proportion of its uh, target, 135 out of 184. So hopefully we'll uh, complete perhaps in this calendar year. This is the Alliance study of perioperative versus adjuvant therapy for resectable disease. Uh, they get four months of fulfenox pre-op and then two months post-op versus surgery upfront and the book standard of six months adjuvant fulfenox. It has accrued uh, approximately half its target population of 350. It has accrued 174. Uh, Dr. Behrman, are you here? Can you come to the microphone? Can you can you let let people know why the trial is accruing slowly? And um, actually, I think the numbers have increased. Um, you know, so I, I, Berman, a couple of things I'd like to highlight. As, as, the chair, a, as a chairman, uh, sorry, as a champion of the study, how can we work to help the Alliance study to get better? So just to ensure that your patients with resectable cancer, that you consider this trial. I think the other thing I'd like to bring to the audience's attention is that um, I think we there's a lot of there's a misperception. This is just uh, uh, is relevant to pancreatic head cancers, but this is also regardless of location, the pancreas resectable body and tail lesions can be enrolled in this study as well. And I think that'll help numbers. Yeah. I, I also wanted to bring out that the Netherlands have started an identical trial, um, this exact same regimen. And so we would certainly like to finish enrollment uh, before they uh, uh, beat us to the punch here. Is it the same number of patients? Sir? The same number of patients? 
approximately yes yeah okay so uh, again um any uh, uh, do you have difficulty opening this trial or just um like the sites that are open the trial or just the surgeons will not be sending patients for the tumor board or, or clinical trial discussion uh, what happens at your place we have institutional preferences for neoadjuvant therapy and in-house trials. That's the competing uh, struggle with this study, honestly. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Devendra. And the other issue is that I think most folks are now coming around to the fact that maybe it's neoadjuvant therapy is the way to go. So I know we haven't done the formal study. This is the, the, the trial. But I think biases and institutional protocols are probably the two biggest barriers. Uh, just explain to me, what is an institutional protocol? Who wants to do institutional protocol, 20 patients, and what do you want to do with that? Is that a rhetorical question or is that for me? <laughs> a, 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 a lot of translational work, honestly. For example, we have a study, we you know collect serial samples, operate after neoadjuvant therapy, do translational work. Um, I, I get that. I was just asking. <laughs> Thanks. I think Steve wanted to make another comment. or. I think Flavio made it. I th again, I think there's the trend has been with the borderline resectable and locally advanced to proceed with neoadjuvant therapy. And I think that, you know, we, we struggle with this in our own institution. So um, I, I think this is an incredibly important question to answer. And, you know, I just am enthusiastic about trying to enroll as many patients as possible. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh... Uh, this is ECOG's other study in uh, pathogenic mutation carriers, BRCA1, 2, or PALB2. Again, these could be somatic alterations, not just germline. And this is double-blind study of Alaparib versus placebo following adjuvant chemotherapy. The accrual uh, is at 30 patients out of 150, so 20% accrued. Actually, the accrual is at 35, she told me yesterday. So. Okay. In terms of the wider landscape, this was the uh, big news out of ASCO GI and pancreatic cancer, the Napoli 3 study. This was Naliri Fox uh, versus gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. Uh, this was the study schema for first line metastatic pancreatic cancer. They were randomized one to one. And this was the take home point. Naliri Fox overall survival was 11.1 .1 months. Uh, incidentally, his, uh, identical to the historical for Phenox index study of 11.1 .1 months versus Gemnap Paclitaxel comparison of 9.2. So it does show in uh, this head to head comparison that the triplet regimen is better than the doublet. In our. Uh, can I go back? Are you using it now in your. Is it NCCN guideline? I'm not sure if it has shown up on the guidelines yet, but essentially this is for Fairnox. That's what we are sticking to. I don't know if how the audience feels, other sites. Who's using it now in the front line? Show of hands? No. I don't see any. Hits. Okay. All right. Okay, that answers the question. All right. We are developing this uh, study, a uh, randomized phase two trial for Fairnox as the backbone total neoadjuvant therapy for resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. We are adding experimental arms. One is an IL-1 RAP antibody, and the second is a PD-1 plus CX CR4 antibody. Uh, so this will go to the SWOG executive committee and hopefully see the light of day soon. This will be approximately 220 patient trial. Uh, notable studies, there are multiple KRAS trials going on, G12D drugs, PAN-RAS inhibitors. I didn't even get to the slides. The news from this week, the Nature publication, a very impressive work by the Balachandran lab at Sloan Kettering of the vaccine the BioNTech's uh, Myrna vaccine. So they took patients with resectable pancreatic cancer, performed surgery, took that surgical specimen to develop a patient-specific vaccine using tumor-specific neoantigens. They gave a dose of atezolizumab and then eight weekly doses of the vaccine, and then patients got adjuvant for Phenox. That will lead to obviously larger studies in the resectable setting at least, uh, 
a potential paradigm shift in how we treat cancer. We'll see how the larger studies, when they open and how they pan out. Uh, locally advanced disease trials are lacking in our portfolio and pretty much across the wider landscape and metastatic disease. Uh, in addition to the triplet, basically for Fairnox or, or Naleri Fox, if anyone is interested, there's not much more out there. So we uh, need better, better outcomes. Thank you. I think um, we somehow didn't include one potential study in KRAS wild type. Maybe you can mention it. Uh, yes, uh, there is a KRAS wild type proposal. Thank you for mentioning that by Dr. Uh, Rachel Safian. That is a, a small population, but an interesting population in pancreas cancer. Second line trial, patients who have KRAS wild type tumors, perhaps about 10% will be treated with uh, panitumumab in addition to chemotherapy versus chemotherapy. Panitumumab, hopefully, obviously, the EGFR antibody should work in a KRAS wild type setting. So that trial is being uh, worked on. The final chemotherapy backbone decision and st st statistical uh, framework is being designed. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, any comments? If not, then I think uh, we, are, we did it on time. We're giving people back 10 minutes. And thank you very much for uh, joining us. And if you're traveling tonight, have safe travels uh, and see you all in um, Chicago.